First of all, I want to thank uh, Sandy for teaching last week while I was in Jakarta. And I bring you greetings from your Presbyterian brothers and sisters in uh, one of the great cities in the world. That's 16 and a half million people. Uh, the three cities in Southeast Asia that are really pulsating are Singapore, Hong Kong, and Jakarta. And uh, it's just an amazing city. Ann and I almost accepted a church planting position there two years ago. It was ideal. Uh, there's a Christian university, a Presbyterian university there, called Palita Harapan University, about the size of Baylor. They wanted me to turn their university chapel into a functioning Presbyterian congregation with a session and everything, with a vision of planting 150 churches slash hospital slash schools around Indonesia. They'd already done about 50. So it was a moving train. Um, I preached twice in that university chapel. I got there on a Monday and they said, uh, well, you got to preach tomorrow at chapel. I said, great. Are you going to come get me about 10? Was it 10, 11? They said, 7 a.m. <laughs> and I thought, college, chapel? There won't be anybody there. There are 3,000 students, faculty, administration. And I preached the following Sunday. They have a Sunday service, 7 a.m. And preached that with 3,000 people. So the church plan that they asked me to do would start with 3,000 people in worship. And we do a second service that would be an ex- Pat service for English <coughs> speaking folks. She responded to the harder challenge and came here. Well, you know, <laughs> seriously, I wanted to do this. It was ideal. It was well funded, so I didn't have to go around begging. Um, and they offered me the thing, and I said, well, I've got to go home and pray that. I've never gone anywhere without what I call the fire in the belly. This It's hard to explain. It's just this thing that happens, and I know I'm supposed to do it. And I was trying to make it happen, but it wouldn't come, it wouldn't come. And I turned them down. I felt stupid in doing so. They came back a few months later. They came back last week. They still don't have the senior pastor. They have a team. Of, one, I have a team of four people. They have three in place. They're just missing the senior leader. And I, when I told them last week, I said, the reason I didn't come, now I know when y'all were interviewing me for this position, while I was in the living room of David and Holly Youngquist's house being interviewed, all of a sudden, it happened. And we walked out. They didn't offer me the position. I walked out and said, Ann, we're coming. And she said, well, I'm getting an offer. I said, Ann, the fire just lit. And there was 1,800 hurdles to get through with the presbytery. I said, I know what I'm and so that's why I didn't go to Indonesia. But anyway, um, we met every day in the equivalent of First Presbyterian Church, right smack in the middle of downtown Jakarta. There are more Muslims in Indonesia than any other country. But here's the brochure of the church we met in. I'm going to pass this around so you can look at it. Um, this is their sanctuary. <coughs> Seats 5,000. <000. coughs> And then, that's, that's their education building. It's 25 stories high. One day we ate lunch up there and went out of the lesson. The Presbyterian Church in Indonesia is alive and booming. And as I said, their vision, it's not this particular congregation, it's the university, which is probably about 15 miles away. Their vision is planning 150 churches, which they've done about a third of them and hospital, and, and that Presbyterian University is the Harvard of Indonesia. Probably a third of the student body is Muslim, because the, the uh, wealthy Muslims want their children to be highly educated. So they send them to the best university. The rest of the student body is, is Christian. All the faculty is Christian. They have medical school, law school, pharmacy school, nursing school, education school. So when they, the vision of planning these churches was to plant a church, school, and medical clinic or hospital 
the hospital staffed by their folks coming from medical school and nursing school. All the teachers are from their teaching you know, you know, yeah, educational school. So you've got a critical mass in each village already of 40 or 50 Christians to start the church. Now Indonesia does not allow the planting of church, Christian church buildings. So we got around that by the architects designing as part of the school a sanctuary um, assembly room that can be used on, on Sunday. So this is the church. Uh, it's quite a, their senior pastor. I had lunch with him one day, Stephen Tong. He's Chinese ethnically, but he's Indonesian. He is also the uh, conductor of the Jakarta Symphony while he's the full time senior pastor. He writes music, writes symphonies. Um, the, the Jakarta Symphony Hall is on the campus of the church and it's ranked as one of the five best symphony halls in the world. And I'm sitting here talking to him and their main service, they have like four services, only one in Bahasa, that's the Indonesian language, that's in their sanctuary at 7 a.m. Sunday morning. They pack it out. Ann and I, two years ago, we went to the English service in one of their chapels with maybe 150, 200 people. Then they have one in Mandarin and one in French or something. Um, Stephen Tong preaches that service 7 a.m. They get, gets on a plane. He's done this for decades. He flies to Singapore, preaches Sunday night in their church plant in Singapore. Then he gets on a plane Monday morning, he flies to Hong Kong, and preaches Monday night at their church plant in Hong Kong. Then gets on the plane Tuesday, flies to Kuala Lumpur, preaches at their church plant there Tuesday night, then flies back to Jakarta on Wednesday. And then and I'm sitting there going, I am worthless. <laughs> Nobody. Um, he's quite a, he's a little tiny guy, very meek, humble, but a dynamo. Hmm? He's, he's about the size of our brain. He's quite tall. Day, so I thought I'd honor that. First of all, did you know that St. Patrick is not Irish? Now, I'm a Scot, and the, the British and the Scots fight over St. Patrick. He was born in the Borders area, but the maps I've seen, it's on the Scottish side of the border. <laughs> and the Brits say well, back then the border was further north, it was really British. Most Irish people think St. Patrick's Irish, so. Tell your Irish friends, and if you're a Scot, say more and kill. So here's, here's an Irish joke. Uh, this Irishman walks into a bar, and he orders three beers. And he does this every Tuesday night for about three weeks. And finally, the bartender says, every time you come in here, you order three beers, but nobody ever joins you. You just sit over there and drink all three beers. He said, well, I'm doing it in memory of my two brothers who were dead. They died years ago, and I'm trying to honor them, and I have a beer for each one of them. And that's, 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 that's really nice. That's, that's touching. That, that really touched my heart. He comes in the next two, Tuesday night and says, uh, give me two beers. 
the bartender says, wait a minute, you always get three beers in honor of your brother, and you drink. He said, well, I stopped drinking. <laughs> Okay, well, it is spring break, and this is our last uh, Colossians class. So I'm not going to wear a tie. Um, celebrate spring, spring break. So why don't we try to wrap up where we've been? Um, a good thing to do is at the end of, of the biblical study is to kind of talk about what, what are the what's Paul really getting at above everything else in this letter. Really, there are two themes that run through Colossians. One is the supremacy of Jesus Christ in both creation and redemption. If you can picture in your mind uh, a construction, theologians talk about a canopy of theology, and there are two pillars that hold it up. One is creation and one is redemption. And uh, which makes sense when you, when you think about Jesus Christ, we usually think of him as just the redemptive pillar. And if you don't get Jesus right, who he really is, that redemptive pillar falls. And if either one of those two pillars or both fall, the whole thing comes down. So you need to get Jesus right, who he is. But we've seen in Colossians, and we see other places as well, that Jesus is actively involved as the second person of the Trinity in creation as well. So he was not sitting idly by <coughs> while the Father created and then he's just in for redemption. No. Everything Paul says in Colossians holds together. Jesus is sort of the glue that holds the entire universe that he created together. So that's why Christology is, you can argue that Christology is the most important part of theology. Karl Barth, reformed theologian in the 20th century, some people argue that he was possibly the greatest reformed theologian. Um, he was so Christocentric that his, his critics said he was almost a Unitarian because he didn't spend a whole lot of time talking about God the Father and the Holy Spirit. He really zeroed in on Christ. And when I was at Union Seminary in Richmond, the three theologians they hammered home, <coughs> hammered into us, were Calvin and Bart and Reinhold Niebuhr. And I'm thankful, I don't agree with Bart and everything, but I'm thankful for his Christological stance. And he really elevates uh, fact that we've got to get Jesus right as fully God and fully man. And when churches, individuals, or denominations drift from a strong Christology, if Jesus gets fuzzy, everything else, the dominoes start to fall. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful uh, for a strong Christology in this church, in our new denomination. And uh, the second theme, uh, though running through here, is, is relationships, relationships in life. How you and I, in a relationship with Christ, how we live that relationship out with spouses, children, employers, employees, how you and I relate to other people, and we talk about making Jesus visible. We can get all our theology right, but if we don't know how to relate to people and have a, a, a good bedside manner, so to speak, um, it can actually negate all of our good theology. So Paul, and we're gonna, we've already seen in your small groups, he brings up all these names at the end of these people. He does it in Romans, when we finish up Romans. He's gonna have a whole laundry list of real life, or eternally alive, <laughs> human beings, uh, but they're real life human beings back then, and a reminder that the Christian faith is a real life, flesh and blood, relational way of living, not just a way of thinking and believing. 
Um, your beliefs will never really be right until or your relationships are right. And your relationships will never really be right until your beliefs are right. So it's, a, it's all interwoven. Um, let me ask you a question. What would you like to see on your tombstone? If you look at how uh, these, uh, this last section of Colossians <coughs> begins, Paul uh, has some nice things uh, to say about a certain young man named Tychicus. He almost, it's almost like he's writing Tychicus's, Tychicus's epitaph here. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother, faithful minister, fellow servant in the Lord. Wouldn't you like to see that on your tombstone? I would, just not anytime soon. Um, here are some actual tombstone epitaphs. Um, I'm finally thin, maybe a little too thin. That's an actual, I found these on the internet, with actual pictures of tombstones. Um, here's one. I was so loaded, I didn't know it was loaded. <laughs> here's another one at a columbarium. I guess you could say I found my niche. <laughs> There's another epitaph, actual, actually on a gravestone. The shop said the brakes were fixed right this time. And then uh, finally, my mother-in-law's casserole really was to die for. <laughs> so here we have Tychicus, um, and we have this great epitaph, beloved brother, faithful minister, fellow servant. So who was Tychicus. You probably talked a little bit about him. Um, he was with Paul in during his first Roman imprisonment. But apparently by the time Colossians is written, he's functioning as a messenger going back and forth between Paul and the church both in Colossae and in Ephesus. Um, so that one part of the church Colossae knows what another part of the church, actually the imprisoned suffering church, Paul and others in the prison in Rome, knows what they know what's going on. And um, let, let me play the role of Tychicus this morning. I've already done a little bit of that, telling you about the church in Indonesia. Uh, when you know, you know, we can get myopic and our faith truncates down to just our congregation or our Sunday school class or our small group or whatever. Um, and we love our church. But let me encourage you to be a global Christian. If you want encouragement, if you want to get just more excited about your faith, go on the internet and just Google What's happening in the church elsewhere in the world? And it'll pull up a whole bunch of things. Uh, I get the privilege of traveling around uh, my church in Baltimore and then in Dallas, uh, and you all are doing it too. Wherever I've gone, I've said, said to the missions people, send me every year strategically where you want me to go. Uh, and I do that for a number of reasons. And it's always in conjunction with on the ground missionaries that we're in partnership with. Um, and so we're, I don't just send me to the French Riviera and see what <laughs> happening on the beach there for Jesus. And so I've gone into some really bad places, some dangerous places, some not so dangerous. And I've been on every, I've been on six of seven continents. I just, I've not been to Antarctica. And over the last 26 years, I, I, I cannot not get excited about the Christian faith and the Christian church in the world today. Because go elsewhere and the church is boom. On any typical day, on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, in Latin America, if this is a typical day, average day, 10,000 people will come to Christ in Latin America. <coughs> 
the same time, in Africa, 10,000 people will come to Christ in the continent of Africa today. 10,000 people will come to Christ today, if it's a typical day, just in the nation of China. And so there's 30,000 new believers. But the big problem with all this excitement <coughs> about coming to Christ, well, who pastors them? They can't build churches fast enough and train pastors, enough pastors to pastor the church. When I was in uh, the Maasai area of Kenya, and we were with the mission team from Highland Park, we slept in tents on the Serengeti. So cool. I'd get up every morning and see Mount Kilimanjaro. And uh, we took showers with buckets of water heated over the fire and then dumped over your little canvas covered stall. It was really kind of funny. But um, I talked to a uh, Presbyterian pastor there. Our church had bought him a motorcycle. He had it, just a regular bike. We bought him a motorcycle because he had 12 churches <coughs> that he pastored. And he put on that motorcycle, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles a year, just traveling around those 12 churches trying to keep them going. Um, so we, we've got it easy. So tons of Christians, not a lot of pastors. So theological education is something we really want to get behind in the majority world, the third world. So um, there's all kinds of great things happening, but if you didn't know that, you might get discouraged here in the U.S. So Tychicus is this messenger going back and forth. He, he wants Paul to be, and the others that are in prison with him to be encouraged. Paul, things are going great in Colossae. And Paul and the others want the Colossian church to be encouraged. So it's a mutual encouragement uh, society, really. And traveling with Tychicus, is another name, and we've met him elsewhere in Scripture, Onesimus. He was the slave of Philemon. Uh, what do we know about Onesimus? Not a whole lot, but there are a whole lot of extra-biblical stories in Christian tradition that Onesimus actually became a bishop in the church, which was, which is a reminder to you and me, you, you talk about uh, Affirmative action, a slave can become a bishop in the Christian church in the first century. So that in, before the ground, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And no social class or status uh, bars somebody from the advancement in the kingdom of God. And Onesimus is a great example of that. Um, and he talks about Tychicus being a faithful minister. And I'd like to stop just for a second and throw that question, throw this question out to y'all. What constitutes a faithful minister or a faithful pastor in the church today? This will be interactive. Throw some things out. Truth. <coughs> truth. 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 Proclamation of truth, I'll say. Telling the truth. A lot of people regard faithfulness. Uh, uh, there is always that relationship thing, but uh, it says in, in stewardship, a man must be found faithful. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, in some of the scriptures, faithfulness, the word used, seems to be interactive with the word truth. Um, uh, of course, as a as a, a pastor of a, of, a, of a Christian church, truth, I mean, it's critical. It's, I mean, you can't get around it. And uh, if you do, you've got, you'll collapse, you know. So telling the truth. Now, yeah. I'm going to tell you something you may not think about very often. Every pastor anywhere in the world is tempted all the time not to tell you the truth. Because if you stay with the scriptures, the truth sometimes is very painful. Yeah. And pastors are dumb, but we're not stupid. <laughs> and we know what you want to hear. And so there's always a temptation for every pastor as he plans his preaching, to plan <coughs> sermons that he knows the congregation will like, because all of us, we want to be liked by other people, don't we? I don't want people running after me with pitchforks and torches. Um, 
that's one of the reasons when I went to the, when I left First Press, while I was here, I was not in charge of preaching. When I did preach, I just took whatever one of the lectionary texts was for that Sunday um, and tried to come to a text cold. In other words, I'm not coming with my trip to lay on you. And sometimes I'm like, oh. But I decided when I left here, I would preach what's called Lectio Continua. That's what John Calvin preached. I didn't do it because I wanted to be like Calvin. I did it because I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that I would really like to be liked <coughs> by everybody in my congregation. And so to avoid the temptation of just preaching what you want to hear, and what's easy, I, I do Lectio Continua. I preach straight through books of the Bible. I've done this for 27 years now. That forces me to preach text I would never choose. I'm like, well, in the Roman series, I can't skip over that. They'll, they'll see that. Then they'll come at me and say, why did you skip over that text? I can't lie to them. Uh, and it also forces you to sit under preaching you don't want to hear. But as Presbyterian type Christians, we ordain our pastors to preach the whole counsel of God, not going through the Bible like this, you know, on the path of least resistance, John 3.16 every week. Um, to preach the whole counsel of God, we trust that when that's done, the Holy Spirit honors that and builds up the body of Christ. And I've seen that happen at Central Church of Baltimore. I've seen that, I saw it happen at Highland Park Church of Dallas. I'm not pulling out my martyr card to get it punched, but it does come with a price. And I always joke around and say, take off my shirt, I can show you what any caliber bullet looks like going in and going out. And the hole's different in the front than it is the back. It's bigger than that. Um, so, truth, telling the truth. What are some other things that make a pastor faithful? Love. Love. When I left here, scared to death to be in the senior pastor's seat. By the way, the first six months I was in Baltimore, I probably called Lewis once a week to apologize. Something, you know. Now that I'm in the seat, Lewis, I can't believe I did that to you. I said, he would laugh and say, I knew you'd call. And the associate, associate pastor asked me all the time, what's it like to be a senior? I said, I'm not going to tell you. It wouldn't do you any good. You'll never know till you get in that seat. But here's what Lewis Bindon told me when I left here that has carried my ministry for 27 years. He said, Ron, I'm going to tell you three things to do. If you do them, you will be successful. <laughs> he said, first of all, work hard. And let your people know you work hard. Let them see your car parked outside the church at 9 o'clock at night because you're in there for some reason. Work hard, let your people know. Don't bandy it around, huh? But I don't know, you, you were a hard worker. Secondly, he said, love your people. And let them know every once in a while that you do love. Don't assume it's like a marriage. Us guys, you know, we assume you wives know we love you. No. I've learned the hard way that I need to say to Ann, I love you. And to my kids, too. Work hard, love your people, and then this third one is sort of like what I've just been talking about with Lectio Continua. He said, believe what you preach. No, um, yeah. Believe what you preach. Don't preach what you believe. I suppose you're going to have to explain that one to me. He said, Ron, you're ordained to preach the whole counsel of God. So, your goal, if you hit a text of scripture that you don't believe, or is hard to believe, or you're wondering what it even means, your goal is to bring your life under that text until you believe it. Don't just go to the parts of scripture you're comfortable with and that you believe strongly and just preach those. 
preach the whole counsel of God with the goal of bringing your whole belief system underneath the Word of God. And I, I am so thankful to Luke for telling me those three things. And I've tried to do those three things. And um, it doesn't make you bulletproof, but it does. I've watched the church, uh, and I'm not just talking about numbers, but I've watched the church grow in health, in strength, in Baltimore and Dallas, and, and it's happening here. So when you're mad at me, because I've preached something on Sunday that ruffles your feathers or turns your life inside out, um, I always tell folks, come at me and let me have it both barrels. If I said something that's not in conjunction with the scriptures, but if you're angry because what I said is in conjunction with the scriptures, your beef's not with me. I'm just, they don't kill the messenger. Your beef is with God. You need to wrestle that out of him, rail out of him. I didn't write this stuff. I just try to say, here's what it says. I don't, sometimes you'll hear me say, I don't like this. I, in fact, I, I, I wish this was not in the Bible, but it is. So we've got to take it seriously and wrestle with it. We may come out at different places. And I've evolved in my thinking about certain passages. Usually it's, you know, evolve is a fancy name for I finally lose the wrestling match to God and give in to what he wants. Um, so apparently Tychicus is a very faithful <coughs> pastor. <clears throat> Let me read you the job description of the perfect pastor. <clears throat> now, everyone wants their pastor to be perfect. Well, here's the job description. The perfect pastor preaches exactly 10 minutes. Secondly, he condemns sin roundly, but never hurts anyone's feelings. He works from 8 a.m. until midnight and is also the church janitor. The perfect pastor makes $40 a week, wears good clothes, drives a good car, buys good books, and donates $30 a week to the church. He's 29 years old and has 40 years of experience. The perfect pastor, above all, is handsome. The perfect pastor has a burning desire to work with teenagers and spends most of his time with the seniors. He smiles all the time with a straight face because he has a sense of humor that keeps him seriously dedicated to his church. He makes 15 home visits a day and is always in his office to be handy when needed. The perfect pastor always has time for the, the session of the church and all of its committees. He never misses the meeting of any church organization and is always busy evangelizing the unchurched. The perfect pastor is always in the next church over. <laughs> if your pastor doesn't measure up, simply send this notice to six other churches that are tired of their pastor too. Then bundle up your pastor and send him to the church at the top of the list. If everyone cooperates in one week, you'll receive 1,643 pastors. <laughs> one of them should be perfect. <laughs> Have faith in what I've just told you. One church broke that chain and got its old pastor back in less than three months. <laughs> also, uh, if you want to get rid of your pastor, here's how you do it. You pray for Pray, Lord, make him the greatest preacher that's ever gotten in the pulpit. And if God answers the prayer, some of the church will snatch him away. <laughs> that's, that's the best way to get rid of it. Seriously, the best thing you can do for your pastor, people always ask me, Rob, what can I do for you? I always say two things. Please pray for me that I don't take the bait that's always coming my way. Somebody wanting to, Ron, if you would just do this or not do this, um, that would not take the bait. And secondly, be Christ's woman, be Christ's man. Nothing fires a pastor up more than seeing his congregation really living for Christ in the day-to-day -day mundane thing. Be gracious men and women of the Lord. And that fires us up to come and preach on Sunday. And thank you for those of you that do those two things for me. Um, I couldn't last in the ministry. Um, whoa, 
We're out of time, man. We got to start. Well, let me just close by saying Paul has a list of Aristarchus. He was part of the missionary team. John Mark, he brings him up again. Remember the clash Paul has with Mark, who's probably the author of the Gospel of Mark, and the first breakup of a missionary team. Things weren't perfect in the early church. And so Barnabas and Mark go off as a missionary team, and Paul and Silas go off. But then at the end, in prison, Paul says, send John Mark. And uh, there's a reconciliation. Uh, there's a guy named Jesus slash Justice, um, Epaphras, uh, Luke, Demas, Archippus. All of these are real live people and they matter. And being in the church of Jesus Christ, you're surrounded by real live people. All of them matter. They may not look like you, be the same race as you, social, economic, status as you, live in the same part of town, but they're your brother and sister in Christ. And we don't, just like in your biological family, you don't get to choose who's in your biological family. In the family of God, God draws First Presbyterian Church together. And we don't get to choose who's going to be here. Uh, we can choose how we will hopefully love them. Um, <coughs> And that doesn't mean feel all lovey-dovey, but we will treat each other with love and respect and grace, even when somebody else is not gracious to us. So um, Paul ends by saying, see uh, that you're, he says um, in verse 17, he says, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. So he says to the Colossians. And so my challenge to you as we end this Colossians, what is your ministry that the Lord has called you to? And are you fulfilling that ministry? If you're not, you're not connecting with the purpose God has to you on this earth. So what is your ministry? Are you fulfilling it? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that uh, you decide to partner with us in advancing your kingdom around the world. You can snap your fingers and make everything happen without us. But you love us too much. You want to include us. You want us to know the joy of your Holy Spirit working mm -hmm. in and through our lives to transform the lives of people that you bring across, across our paths. I pray for all these men and women today that are here, including myself that we would have a hunger and thirst to know what is our ministry. And that may be changing over the years. And Lord, we thank you that whatever you're calling us to do, you will give us the gifts through the power of your Holy Spirit to carry out that ministry. And so, Lord, give us the courage and the joy of fulfilling our ministries that we might make Jesus visible to others and extend your kingdom across San Antonio and literally around the world. And we make our prayer in Jesus' name.